Well, welcome. The Costume Society of America thanks you for joining our very first Conversations on Dress web panel. I'm thrilled to welcome you and be your host tonight. My name is Monica Sklar, and I'm the Vice President of Technology for Costume Society of America, CSA. I'm a fashion professor at the University of Georgia, where I teach courses in pop culture fashion history, the history of dress, 19th century to the present. I manage our historic clothing and textiles collection and engage with undergraduates all the way through PhD students and colleagues on fashion history. The topic for this panel is Black representation in the fashion history classroom. We at CSA wanted this to be our first virtual panel discussion we hosted, as it's timely and important, and that is echoed in the nearly 300 people that registered for tonight's conversation. Please remember to mute your microphone and to turn off your camera in order to improve the streaming quality, as well as to shut down other applications if you can. While we are broadcasting live right now, this content will be recorded and will be available open access on YouTube, starting likely tomorrow or as soon as we can. Should you have questions for today's speakers and panelists, please submit them via the chat box and reserve your private conversations for the private chat feature that's also available. Should you have general questions regarding CSA's digital content, please contact Graham Witzberger at Conversations on Dress at Costume Society of, I'm sorry, CostumeSociety.com. Without further ado, let's welcome our moderator for today, Indira Washington, who is a journalism and fashion student, undergraduate student at the University of Georgia, and she will introduce today's presenters. Hello, everyone. Today, I'd like to introduce myself, Indira Washington. Like Dr. Sklar said, I am a consumer journalism student at the University of Georgia, and today we have um, or tonight we have these panelists. We have Dr. Tamika Ellington, who is the Interim Assistant Dean for the College of Arts and an Associate Professor in Fashion Design at Kent State University. We have Dr. Yolanda Sanders, who is the Donna R. Danielson Professor in Textiles and Clothing, Chair of the Department of Apparel, Events, and Hospitality Management at Iowa State University, Kimberly Jenkins, who is an assistant professor, School of Fashion, Fashion Studies at Ryerson University, and Dr. Jonathan Michael Square, who is a lecturer faculty member in the Committee on Degrees in History and Literature at Harvard University. And the panelists are welcome to turn on your cameras and microphones at this time. And if anyone else could turn off your cameras and microphones, that'll be great. Thank you. Tonight, we will be having a round table discussion with about 12 questions, more if we have time. And we will be addressing one panelist at a time, but others are welcome to chime in. There will be 60 minutes for questions and 30 minutes for audience questions. So first I'd like to ask Professor Sanders a question. So ideally, what does black representation in the fashion history classroom look like to you? Thank you, Adira. Uh, to me, it looks like uh, being presented throughout the time periods. Now, oftentimes we teach fashion history in a chronological order. And if we're representing uh, Blacks within that, then they need to be uh, integrated throughout each of the periods because there have been contributions throughout uh, history. So thinking about if you're going to present history in a thematic way, or in a chronological way, uh, providing examples because they're out there. They may not be as easy to find uh, for instructors, but making that effort to uh, integrate them is important. Could I add on to that? Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't want to start off the conversation by jumping on my soapbox, but I feel like you can have a conversation about black representation without having a conversation about supporting and you know making black faculty feel comfortable so and I think if you have a diverse faculty and a diverse student body 
everything else will start to fall into line. Awesome. Oh, did you have anything else to say? Well, yes, I, I absolutely agree with Jonathan that you have to have the faculty and administrators. And as an administrator myself, um, having administrators that are able to move any barriers for individuals that want to uh, have a, a diverse curriculum. Definitely. I agree with that. Even in the student body, it's really important to have diversity. It really helps all those voices come forward. My next question is going to be for Professor Jenkins, and that's going to be, how does changing the content of the classroom to include more BIPSC representation impact students' future careers in fashion history or careers in the fashion industry in general? Well, let's see. So, ha so have having it more on the curriculum or in the syllabus? Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, just kind of repeating what um, Dr. Sanders said, um, having the I guess having it threaded through the course outline uh, is key um, in terms of representation. Um, thinking through the topics and themes uh, of what you want to address. Um, and so I, I teach fashion history and theory classes. So um, if we're talking about history, um, you would have, um, it, would, it would just take, I think for faculty members, um, a little bit more work in terms of just thinking about how you can integrate um, BIPOCs into um, each kind of time period, um, understanding the different histories there, maybe bringing in different concepts and uh, theories into your history, your in your theory classes. So um, if you're doing fashion cultures or like we do fashion concepts and theory, um, bringing in sort of a component on fashion and race, fashion and politics, um, or even if it's, um, oh gosh, I don't know, uh, like thinking about, just thinking of some of the different concepts we talk about. Uh, fashion and sustainability, just finding ways to kind of expand those topics to include um, uh, things that matter to um, the BIPOC audience. And then by adding those into the curriculum, do you think that that impacts their future careers in fashion history or in the fashion industry in general? Um, I think when, in, I mean, in terms of their career, it depends on what they're studying or what they want to go into. Um, so I guess in terms of career, if it's a fashion design student, um, if we're doing a fashion history class, it's making sure that there is a diverse representation there so that they can feel inspired, see themselves. Um, if it's a student who wants to go into communication or marketing, um, it's showing different power brokers throughout the industry where people of color who are doing this work, um, different representations of style or pioneers um, who've kind of broken paths or um, shown different ways of doing business uh, and communication in the fashion industry um, could be inspiring. Um, and so, uh, like, for instance, in my fashion and race class, uh, we spend a week on how the business of fashion deals with race. So we talk about retail discrimination, um, diversity and inclusion, um, kind of like all the diversity and inclusion issues that's kind of grab for diversity and inclusion officers. So it gives us this kind of examination uh, of the industry and what's going on and how those students can be sort of change agents or um, uh, sort of uh, intervene in some of the issues that we're seeing and the problems that we see in the business of fashion. So um, so those are some of the ways that we can see that happen. Awesome. Does anyone else have any ways we could add on? Okay. Well, so the, oh, oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> uh, I would like to say that you know, as we develop curriculum within our department, some of the discussion has been, how do you define that representation? 
how do you define um, social justice or diversity? Because sometimes we have classes that we want to retool and individuals have taught the class for a while, but um, maybe not infusing uh, those concepts into the class um, to the level that we would like to. And so helping uh, our faculty understand that uh, maybe showing one image or talking about one group or one subset of a group uh, is not really infusing the curriculum, that it has to be broader and deeper than that too. And I would just add on to that by saying that, you know, if you're a faculty member and you're watching and you're wondering how can I sort of diversify my syllabus, how can I amplify the voices of minorities on my syllabus, I would start a conversation, like be open about it. Um, I mean, you shouldn't put the labor on a minority faculty member or a black faculty member, but I think you should open up a conversation and be like, you know, can we get coffee? Can we can we have a Zoom date? Like I, I really want to pick your brain or like maybe put put it on Facebook or social media. Like I'm I'm really working hard to like be more representative on my syllabus. So I think by just opening a conversation, it's a really important first step. Awesome. This next question is going to be for anyone who has a good idea here. It's um could you guys please give an example of black fashion history that should be part of the fashion history classroom yet is often not covered thoroughly or to the same degree as the contemporaries of that person or artifact or trend? Well, I'll start. <laughs> um, I mean, if anyone's familiar with my work, this answer won't be a shock, but I think slavery um, and capitalism. I think there's not a very like robust conversation about how fashion is embedded in the rise of global capitalism. And I think I'll, I always think of fashion as being like a slither of capitalism. And of course, being a scholar of slavery, I always think about how fashion is sort of embedded, sort of rooted in coerced labor. And I think a lot of conversations around fashion and the fashion system, even in the 18th and 19th century, don't mention enslaved peoples or slavery. I guess I'll, I'll jump in too. Um, I, I mean, gosh, it, it, that's so broad, you know? I mean, because it's like we're talking fashion history. So, I mean, you could go decade by decade if you wanted to and talking about who to include. So um, absolutely, you know, starting with, uh, or even before, you know, the slave trade um, and how um, the, the establishment of like kind of uh, the textile industry and um, the people who, enslaved people who were making clothes um, really helped kind of launch what we know as the fashion industry, especially in the Americas. Um, but um, when it comes to, I, I guess if we want to talk about like from the 19th century into kind of quote unquote contemporary fashion um, from 1900 on to today, um, I think it's time to reframe how we start talking about modernity. And um, that, that's a very popular or one of the key or foundational frameworks we use in teaching fashion history and um, how, what the fashion system involves or what the business of fashion started off with a couple of centuries ago. Um, and so starting there and thinking through who um, the founding practices of fashion from design to marketing um, to retail and display, uh, all the way to the ways in which we communicate fashion um, through marketing and editorials and photography, all the image making that goes into it. Um, how can you thread um, the, the, the non-Western or non-Euro-American or white experience through that? And how, in, in really sitting and reflecting with in what ways has modernity really been kind of um, hinged on um, other, you know, having the other um, or on blackness 
or Asian-ness or the, 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 the Orient, you know, the fantasy of the Orient. I mean, there's just so many directions you could go in thematically and thinking about how um, these various identities, these different forms of oppression have all shouldered um, what we know is like uh, modernity and fashion. Um, so, um, so, so yeah, that, that's one way of thinking through it is um, uh, re-examining the framework and um, maybe even kind of restructuring the framework of how we teach fashion history. And I'll, I'll add on to that. Uh, my work has also been within the area of slavery and um, slave clothing worn by slaves. But one area that really doesn't um, really have rest as we could is entrepreneurs. Many of our students are interested in having their own business and being entrepreneurs. And uh, people of color have been entrepreneurial in so many ways, uh, from being sustainable in their use of materials, um, starting their own businesses, to um, small cottage industries, to, to larger corporations. So I think that would be another fascinating and exciting way of so looking at um, entrepreneurial endeavors of uh, people of color within the fashion industry. You know, added to that, uh, one thing that I was just talking about with Robin Givon a week or so ago was that I feel I, I had gone through this book on Gucci uh, several months ago, and it was talking about really kind of the genesis of Gucci and Gucci o Gucci and mm -hmm. working in this hotel in in England and inspired by all the wealthy people who came through with their luggage and really studied their luggage. Um, this is the early 20th century. So um, studying their luggage and then having this light bulb moment to create um, luggage, you know, luxurious luggage like that uh, with under the Gucci name and really constructing a heritage, uh, a logo, uh, a, a mythology, a whole legacy. Um, and then when Aldo Gucci, one of the sons by the mid-century really kind of took the helm, um, he really kind of shaped Gucci into what it had become most famous for. And so um, the horse bit shoe and and again, just kind of creating this family crest and just making it seem like they're just, they've got this uh, grand heritage or legacy. And that's what gave this era of luxury and aspiration. Um, and, and I mean, many other things um, under all those ideas that made Gucci what it is. Um, it's it's uh, integration of art and you know all these different things that made Gucci so popular. Um, but what I'm getting at is, you know, it was this kind of hustling mentality um, that Gucci o Gucci um, founding father had. And one thing that I was astounded by was that I found that those ideas and uh, around kind of working with this um, leatherware and coming up with all these ideas of this legacy and, and a name and um, playing with logos and things like that wasn't too unlike what Daniel Dapper Dan Day was doing in the 1970s. And so what is the difference here? You know, we we put one group of people on a pedestal and, you know, we, we infuse them with all of this aspiration and, um, uh, you know, we see them as a, a heritage brand like Hermes and Louis Vuitton and, you know, all, and Chanel. And when Dapper Dan kind of hustles and creates these different things, he's seen as just street or a hustler making these illicit goods. I mean, which it could be argued he was making illicit of goods, but it was what I guess my point is that, you know, when it comes to this canon that we establish in fashion history of who are the icons, who are the quote unquote geniuses, the innovators, and then who are the people who just get left on the margins as just kind of streetwear or urban wear. Um, Daniel Dapper Dan Day gets left out among many others, you know, when it comes to fashion editors or photographers or stylists in the past 150 years, you know, we decide on, and, and, and we, the educators don't realize, or maybe they do realize how much power they have. 
they get to curate and choose who we remember, who we continue to remember, who we regard, who we canonize, and who just kind of gets left over or as maybe a special topic, you know, or um, just a uh, footnote or further reading or something like that, you know. So um, it's time to kind of expand the canon, broaden, broaden the canon um, when it comes to the fashion genius. And, and that goes back to what I was saying earlier, of just we need to re rethink what fashion modernity is and what it, it looks like and what, um, what makes fashion modern. Um, and, you know, we could start at the 19th century and question, you know, we can, you can keep your Charles Frederick Worth, you know, but let's think about some other people. Maybe you compare the Charles Frederick Worth with Elizabeth Keckley. Um, you know, they're both couturiers, you know, in, in one regard or another. So, um, so yeah, it, it's time to also rethink the canon in that way and, and all of the stories, the, the stories that we regard in, in fashion history. This next question is for Professor Jonathan Square, and it's, how does the pedagogy of how fashion history is taught impact diverse student involvement and classroom dynamics or conversational dynamics? What can inspire more student voices? Well, I think diverse students or students with diverse backgrounds feel represented or they feel supported. Then they'll be more active and more engaged in course material. I've had so many experiences and so many stories told to me of like minority students who just didn't feel heard or didn't feel seen and they weren't represented in curricula and they end up sort of feeling despondent or dejected and they end up dropping out out of the program. And that's not true for every minority student. Um, different people have different ways of coping with oppression. So I've known some minority students who are able to sort of like take the curriculum and make it work for them, but it doesn't work for everyone. Um, so I think, you know, one thing that I've been working on as an educator is even though I identify as queer, one of my specializations, like I don't really specialize in gender and sexuality, but more and more of my students are identifying which trans and queer ident identities. And I realized that my syllabus has to reflect that. And um, so I, the last time I taught black beauty culture, I had a, a few units on like queerness and beauty. And my students literally thanked me for, you know, diversifying my syllabus in that way. Um, so students really respond to um, when you make changes on a syllabus and when they feel represented and heard um, in the course material. One other thing I would add, uh, and I think this kind of ties in with what you were just asking, uh, and also how we can, um, or even how educators in this room can expand uh, their um, uh, curriculum, is maybe making it a, a okay, well, so like a, one assignment I had last fall for Fashion and Race was um, I had this weekly topic, um, called um, uh, sort of like decentralizing fashion history. And so I made it an assignment of what would you like to see brought into the canon of fashion history, which is something I've kind of infused in my fashion and race database now. And that is allowing the students to observe what they see missing in fashion history books or in conversations or classes. And so their assignment was to kind of write a short paper or profile and, pre and give a presentation um, the following week in class about what you'd like to see in the fashion canon and why. Um, it's a great opportunity for students to make themselves heard and kind of feel empowered to co-author the narrative of fashion history. And um, it also educates the educator, you know. So, uh, you know, I've had students in that class say, I want to induct the, the do-rag into, you know, fashionable objects, you know, or um, head wraps, you know, for women, or um, Eunice Johnson from the from Ebony Fashion Fair, and, you know, just all of these unsung figures uh, who get left on the margins. That was a, a way to kind of give the microphone to the students and let them um, kind of perform that project and, and sort of induct who they want to see. 
so that's that's another thing is just kind of collectively building a checklist together. And I will follow up with that. And if there's the opportunity, then to create a seminar type class from one of the topics that's brought up by students. And we have done that um, within our program. We have a class for the last couple of years that's on Black Lives Matters in fashion. And it was initiated by a black male student and an idea. So if you have the opportunity uh, within your curriculum, then take take that to delve deeper into a topic that is proposed by students. Mm -hmm. And it could also culminate into it. Um, Yolanda, you may have done this uh, like an exhibition or something. And Jonathan, I know you've done sort of like a end, of, like instead of a formal paper, sort of like a end of semester exhibition mm -hmm. of work. I mean, I know with us remote teaching, that may not be as easy, mm -hmm. or maybe you can do a virtual exhibition. But that could be another thing, replacing the final paper with um, sort of a virtual exhibition of this work um, yeah. also. Uh, Kelly Reddy, Dr. Kelly Reddy Best taught the class for us. And at the end, uh, we partnered with the local library in the community and the students had a poster session and then a um, community discussion and presentation of, of their work. And it was wonderful. So the exhibition was up for a couple of weeks and then we invited the campus community and the surrounding community to the student presentations. Um, yeah. Or a zine also. Yes. Um, yes. Creating a zine too. It could be an end of the semester, a collective project mm -hmm. um, of creating that. And it's, something that can be kind of kept, you know, uh, and archived, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something I did in my Black Beauty Culture class. We created a zine called The Culture, and I don't know how this chat function works, but I would put it in the chat. It's online. It's online. Yeah. 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 Just as a yeah. reminder, <laughs> You can use the chat function at any time during this to ask your own questions as well. The next question is for Professor Jenkins. So students often grasp history concepts best when they can link to current news stories and see how it's all connected. Black hairstyles is an example of a concept often not taught in the fashion history classrooms that is still frequently debated in high schools and workplaces. What are the best resources for educators to connect history with the current? Well, um, I mean, it could be, um, gosh, there's so many sources. I mean, there's like a, you could do, a, you could collect numerous, um, I mean, I, I guess depending on sort of the online board system that you're using um, to lead the course um, as a resource space. Um, um, it, it could be a place where you pick your favorite um, resources, uh, like on, like um, your most trusted, online publications or magazines, websites, institutions, gallery spaces, zines, um, museums, and just kind of having them all sort of categorized and listed on the board um, for the students to use to kind of guide them to sort of the best or most critical sources to use and then kind of develop assignments from there where um, that's sort of like the pool of resources that you'll always draw upon together. Um, oh, and podcasts also. Um, and so that could be something that you could integrate into um, uh, certain assignments or readings. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, the, the possibilities are endless, really. And I think in part, this is a problem with academia just to answer your question about sort of addressing like current events and how it might relate to issues of race and representation. Academic production is n not the most nimble. Like it, it just moves at glacial speeds. Like, you know, books take years, exhibitions take years. Um, so, so in this case, I often rely on social media or think pieces. So if something happens, um, then I'll assign like a tweet or a think piece 
our uh, social media posts. Um, and that's something I'll, I use a lot just in my own work in general, social media. Like for instance, the um, Harper's Bazaar cover with Bi Viola Davis and the Simone Biles Vogue cover for the September issue. I had a lot of problems with both those issues and I took the social media. Like had I gone through like a traditional academic route, then it had would have to go through peer review and like, you know, several, like it takes months or even years sometimes for, the, for those things to come out. So I would tell educators to rely on like more nimble sources like media, social media, podcasts, like Kim said, um, think pieces. This next question is for Professor Square. So as students or professors who want to do papers, projects, exhibits, and scholarship, where does one get the artifacts or the stories of people who are less documented in the classroom, libraries, and museums? Yeah, you know, I've gotten this question before, and often it's framed um, as if that, you know, looking at the connection or like the history of fashion and slavery is something that's really esoteric or really niche or really hard. But I actually think we're, we're, we're literally sitting on the documents, like we're sitting on the sources. Like the sources that I use often are online. It, it's not like I'm doing any like hardcore sleuthing. Like I use NYPL, I use the Smithsonian, I use um, Library of Congress, the Met, VNA. Like all these sources are, a lot of them are free and online. Um, so, I mean, I would start with the sources that are readily available at your university, um, the sources that are available online, the sources at institutions that are in your community or in your city. Um, so it's, it's less about source material and I think it's more about the kind of questions that you're answering. I think educators need to change their research questions and their research agenda and the kind of questions that they're answering in class as opposed to where can I find the sources because the sources are readily available. This next question is for Professor Sanders. How can we more effectively use the historic clothing collections in a classroom in ways that demonstrate more representation when the collections often do not have objects that represent Black designers, Black donors of artifacts, significant Black cultural movements, and trends? We know we can improve collecting and preservation goals henceforth, but what are some ways to better use the collections universities have at this time? Thank you. That's, that's a hard question because if the representation isn't there, uh, yeah, people continue to use what they have. So I will say that it's important for curators and collectors to um, broaden the, the mission of their collections and start collecting in an intentional way um, pieces that represent larger groups of individuals too. And, you know, many collections start with you know, donors or they start very small and it's, you know, maybe faculty members or donors of the institution, but reaching out and um, asking for you know, newer piece, you know, pieces that represent a, a wider range. And so, you know, it, it is hard if you, if you don't have them um, there, you need to seek them other places, uh, partnering with other institutions. Uh, not working in a silo and say, well, we don't have it here. It must, you know, we can't do this. Well, someone else may have it. So, um, you know, reaching out and, and working with others, creating that network. Uh, and, um, and then, yeah, being creative on, on trying to get the information. I would also add that you know, if you have a, there's a collection at your institution or at your university and the pieces aren't the most representative, it's also a good opportunity just to have a really frank and honest, candid conversation about class, privilege, and whiteness. Mm -hmm. And you could even pair, um, you know, a visit to the, the, that collection with a, a reading by 
that addresses some of those issues. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess I would call it like reading a museum collection against the grain or against the thread or so looking at it critically. This next question is for Professor Square. In what ways has your positionality informed how you have learned and taught fashion history? Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's quite a question. I don't even know where to start. Um, wow, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in the dress of enslaved people and I, I am a dis descendant of enslaved people. So, I mean, my, my work is very personal. Um, I think all the work that we're doing is, is in some way biographical. Um, so yeah, like, I mean, certainly my interests are related to the fact that one, I'm a fashion lover and consumer, I'm an esthete. So I, I love fashion on a personal level, but also, you know, I've carried that interest with my own personal history as an African-American, as a descendant of enslaved people. And also one of my interests, one of my growing interests is like, the ways in which gender and sexuality intersect with, with fashion and I'm also a queer person. So yeah, it, shape, it completely shapes what I'm doing. And which is why I think that would actually, just to go back to my earlier point about like having diverse faculty, is that when you have diverse faculty, this, this whole question like, oh, like how do we make our syllabus more diverse? Like how do we address all these different issues? How do we like represent, it's, it's like, it's already, it's so intrinsic to what we're doing. Like it doesn't, it's not even a question. I just teach this, like, I don't think about it. Like it's my, my syllabi are, are diverse because it's part of my experience and it's intrinsic, intrinsic to what I do. Okay, my next question is for Professor Jenkins. So a lack of historic background for white students can mean they don't recognize the gravitas when a significant moment in black fashion history is presented. Examples might be Anne Lowe's design salons in New York City or Beverly Johnson on the Vogue magazine cover in 1974. How can students or professors address this lack of cultural knowledge to get the concepts better? Hmm. Um, so how can the students grasp it better or the, the educator also? It could be both, but the focus is on how the educator can help the student grasp it. Um, I would say, um, you know, I, I always I, I kind of wrestle with that question because you know it's it's kind of begging for a, a student who doesn't. Gosh, I'm trying to think of how to even like an, answer that question because it's you know it's sort of begging for white students to kind of care about a history outside of themselves. So, um, so that's difficult um, to respond to. Um, you know. Um, I, I have to think about that one. I'm not sure how to answer that. And I, I agree, it, it is hard because uh, if you have students in the classroom that have been trained in, in a certain way about history and then uh, having to flip what they have come into the classroom with have been taught for years and years and years and years. Uh, sometimes there's resistance and then you have to get past that. And so um, it, it is difficult if you know, the, the history itself isn't known or it's been taught in a way, uh, then you have uh, double the work to do of you know, being the person to say, oh, everything that you've you know, have been taught for the last you know, 12, 15 years is not quite accurate. Uh, just recently, I shared something on uh, Facebook and one of my uh, friends it, it just said, oh gosh, 
do you feel like we should get a refund for the past history that we were taught? And I just, you know, thought, oh, yes, that's great. And yeah, this was um, a, a person that identified as white, and they just was kind of like, wow, oh, geez, I just, you know, there's all these things I didn't know. And so sometimes it is, um, you have to also meet someone where they are, help them along, and realize that, you know, sorry, you weren't given the whole picture uh, in, in the in their past history that you were taught. And I mean, I think it's something that all of us um, fashion scholars and even putting aside conversations about race and representation, I think it's something that we struggle with, like making a case for fashion and in particular in the case of us on the panel, like making a case for why it's important to put fashion in conversation with questions of equity and in inclusivity. Because people think, you know, fashion is it's it's niche. It's 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 relegated to the realm of like you know something that's special or feminine or queer, but it's not something that people think that they engage with on a daily basis. But of course they do. So I think it's something that we're it's a question that we're constantly grappling with because you know we're often sidelined and marginalized within academia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that question was of particular interest to me myself because I noticed in my fashion courses, some of the other students were struggling with connecting the past moments to the present and connecting the concepts of race beyond a certain point in time. So really understanding how to give that background, I think, is really important, especially today. Mm -hmm. Part of that is having educators that are able to do that in the classroom too, and are willing to. And then this question is something that anyone can answer. Um, I'd like to ask for you guys to please share a publication, website, film, book, or exhibit you'd like to point the audience to as a can't miss example of black fashion history that they should check out. I mean, this might be shameless self-promotion, but I would start off with the people who are here on this panel. <laughs> so, I mean, I'll let Kim <laughs> share her work and Yolanda, you know, share her work. But I mean, I have a platform called Fashion Itself and Slavery and Freedom. It lives mainly on social media and I post literally daily on this topic. Um, and, you know, I'm in the process of writing a book manuscript on fashion and slavery. Um, but I mean, I could rattle off like list of like articles, books, exhibitions. Um, the work has been done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, I would chime in and um, the Fashion and Race Database provides um, a source that could be useful. It's a work in progress right now. It's still building many resources, but we're collecting books, articles, lectures, um, videos, podcast episodes, a calendar of events, a directory of people doing the work, um, kind of a one-stop shop for people who want to expand the way they teach and understand fashion history and theory. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, because <laughs> it's, you know, it's something that kind of going back to your previous question for me, it's just it's frustrating, you know, it's kind of like with the work I do, the work I do is exhausting enough, but then to kind of have to worry about how can I make people in the classroom care or my colleagues to care to expand. I don't know what to say at this point. You know, I don't, you know, I don't know how to do, how to get someone to actually care that anyone outside of the lens of white fashion history matters. Um, or, you know, where to go. I mean, I am a black woman who has learned fashion history inside out and spent most of my time learning everything there is to know about white fashion history, European history. So if I can do it, anyone else can do it. So, you know, when it comes to 
me being a walking library or ha holding anyone's hand in terms of what they should be using, what they should look up, what kind of articles they should use, what kind of books or do the work. You know, I've been doing the work my entire career. Um, I, again, I've learned everything about fashion, white fashion history and theory. And I've also done, you know, the work of trying to expand it and decolonize it and decentralize it and get people to care about it in the classroom. So um, I just don't know what to say. You know, I can't be a walking directory or catalog for everyone in terms of where they should go because I've done all of that. I've spent summers building my fashion and race um, syllabus or thinking through fashion history and theory, um, going into lived experiences and histories that were not my own, you know, talking about rockabilly and mod culture, you know, to students, you know, that's not my lived experience, you know, knowing all of the Euro best European exhibitions to go to. I've been doing that for almost 10 years. So um, you just really have to do the work, start digging. Yeah, and I'll just follow up. There's a lot of great search en engines out there. And um, so <laughs> it's, as you know, uh, both Jonathan and Kimber Kimberly have said, yeah, yeah, get out there and do the work. You know, we've had to, um, so there's tools to do it. I have another question for all of you. It's um, as history is being made daily, what designers, designs, artifacts of the lived experience happening in current life should be preserved, including or included for future future fashion history scholarship and considered for curriculum? Like, how do we decide what we should make history? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I would jump in like with what I was already saying of just in a little bit of what Yolanda was saying. You know, we decide on, you know, we're all kind of the custodians in some way, shape or form of what we preserve, what we decide to remember um, and how we keep it and protect it. Um, and so, you know, it, it really comes down to curators also and conservators, I know, really thinking about the power that they have to help kind of acquire certain sources, rescue certain items or objects and keep them in their holdings and make a case um, to their directors or, or head curators about, or, or the whole institution about why they should keep these things um, in terms of expanding history, because our history and our memory is only as good as what we preserve. And so if we're not holding on to things and letting it die or deteriorate um, or get lost, you know, countless sketchbooks of BIPOC designers lost to, you know, in the annals of history, they, you know, destroyed uh, in some sort of way or, you know, left with lovers or family members who just passed it along and it's sitting and collecting dust and then fading as we know, you know, or photographs. You know, it really, you have to have a desire an inclination to want to seek out these sources, find them, uh, a colleague of ours, uh, Rachel Fenderson, did the work of, you know, kind of organizing and, and capturing the history of the late designer Jay Jackson through a, th a thesis project, you know, I mean, not even being a formal or established curator yet. She just did that for her thesis research. No curator that we know of, or very few have really kind of, or that we know of, have bothered to put an exhibition together. So she did it, you know, that was her MA thesis project. And then she turned it into an exhibition fresh out of school. You know, why aren't curators doing that? Why don't they have the inclination to kind of excavate these histories and, um, and kind of establish these very crucial exhibitions or, you know, um, and but this also goes down to an, an even deeper root, you know, um, when it comes to getting into these spaces, whether it's in education, or in the professional realm. Um, we need BIPOCs, you know, first having the inclination or the resources to get into these design schools or these curatorial programs and being feeling supported, um, making it through and helping to um, be those change agents, be those people who can kind of preserve these histories. So first they gotta get into these programs or know about them and feel welcome in them. And then we need to have museums 
institutions, gallery spaces, uh, university archives that welcome people of color in there also to bring their lived experience and expertise um, to help preserve these histories. Um, so yeah, it, it really, we need that inclination. We also need to kind of make that space um, for, for BIPOCs to come in there and really help expand the narrative of history, expand the holdings in our histories and, and galleries, and not just be kind of sectioned off into just these ethnic museums or galleries, you know? In the larger museums and institutions, they need to live there. And I'll follow up on that as, you know, thinking about uh, from the curatorial side, storage. Oh, there may not be enough storage to add. Well, review what you have. Do you need 20 of the same white petticoat? Or would, you know, um, narrowing down the collection of those so you can add some other items? And then, yes, uh, yeah, I, I've been in academia before everyone on this panel has been born. And the environments within our organizations and in our institutions that have museum studies, have collections, need to be more welcoming to people of color. You need to be able to feel comfortable to go into a collection and work and not um, feel like you're not, you don't belong. So, um, so it just, there needs to be some conversations within institutions and changes within staff if need be to uh, make our spaces um, comfortable. Because yes, oftentimes individuals are going into spaces where they don't see representations of themselves to begin with. That's not comfortable. And then if you're treated like we shouldn't be there in the first place, or if you're, you know, I've, I've been to some um, meetings where discussions have been held about um, topics of diversity without really thinking about the human element, more the commercialization of, of textiles or apparel, but not think not anyone discussing within the panels or the organization and during the meeting about the humans um, and the human resources that were taken advantage of to create these textiles. And I'm, you know, I'm like I said, I'm old and I'm tired. I'm tired of it. <laughs> just I'm tired of it. And um, it, it just it needs to change. And so our organizations need to think about this um, and our institutions do. And there needs to be some real conversations about uh, how do we create spaces um, in the classroom, within our um, archives that people feel comfortable. Because again, I've never been in an archive where I've seen clothing that you know, represents myself. Mm -hmm. And going with that, I mean, absolutely, it really resonates and just sort of like in what Jonathan was saying earlier, just once we can sit with and get comfortable with the fact that, you know, it's time to start integrating uh, the transatlantic slave trade and the history of enslavement in, that's going to really crack open a lot of different ways of talking about this, um, you know, and it, those uncomfortable stories, those uncomfortable histories, uh, when it comes to um, dress and the body. Um, and um, another thing I had wanted to add, I just lost my train of thought. Um, oh yeah, it just sort of, and then, so once we talk about this, it circles back to what we were just talking about earlier of how can we make the curriculum more broad or welcoming. So you do get these people of color coming into these programs, but as Yolanda was saying, then they don't feel welcome because then, you know, history course after history course, or theory course after theory course, is just really so fixated on just one certain experience or identity or culture. And so what are they supposed to do? You know, how do they work with that? You know, when you're a person of color, how do you navigate that? How do you get inspired or see where you fit in when it comes to proposing a project um, or thinking about, you know, how you can fit into this gallery space or into this institution? 
um, when clearly, you know, um, the, the foundation that the program uh, or institution has built um, does not acknowledge that person's identity or history or what they can bring to the table. So um, there's a lot of hoops that you have to jump through. Mm -hmm. I, I know I did, you know, in grad school. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it's kind of like that thing, you know, historians talk about with Ginger Rogers dancing with Fred Astaire. She had to kind of do the whole dance backwards and in heels. That's yeah. how I felt, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, as a person navigating fashion studies. Well, and I will say one other thing, as, and I'll get off my soapbox after this, maybe. Um, you know, as we talk about, oh, it'd be nice to have um, representation within the classroom uh, and of faculty and getting individuals um, to be faculty members. Uh, you know, so those of you that are faculty that are guiding graduate students, when they come to you with a topic, that may not be comfortable for you, do not shut them down. Do not devalue the topic. Do not shut them down. Do not uh, discourage them of taking that topic on. You know what, if you don't feel comfortable, give me a call. You know, <laughs> we'll figure it out. Um, because I've heard stories after stories after stories of uh, students of color that you know, want to study a topic and their advisor has not felt comfortable with it and they've been discouraged. You know, um, yeah, they're walking and dancing backwards in hills and having sometimes to do somersaults and cartwheels. And it is just not fair. And so then we say, oh, well, we can't get any students into our graduate programs. Well, it's hard. That's so precisely it. And that's the work of um, faculty members of color. You know, back when I was um, uh, in New York teaching, you know, I, I was a part-time lecturer teaching, you know, certain classes, but then I would get black students coming to me from another class who felt that they weren't seen or heard and would ask me to look at their portfolio or review their project. This is free labor I'm doing. You know, of course I'm doing it for them because I care, but this is some of the things that black faculty members end up doing. You're an emotional, you're a therapist, you're an emotional, you're an advisor, you know, a shadow advisor in some ways, doing all of this work that some people in the audience may have no idea that their colleagues are helping and pitching in and doing silently um, because the students, exactly what Yolanda say, don't feel heard or seen. And so they're going to go knock on other doors or, or go to who they know that will support them. But that puts an extra layer of labor onto us. Yes. And we need faculty of color to move up through the ranks so that they have the ability to make institutional changes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you put that extra labor on people, it doesn't help them move forward. So support your graduate students, support your colleagues um, and faculty members that are working in these areas. Don't leave them alone to do it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and speaking to kind of uh, the environments and sometimes toxic environments of institutions, um, you know, you don't want to say anything, you know, especially if you're in a precarious labor situation. You know, I was a part time lecturer. You don't want to ruffle feathers because you yeah. want to be um, annualized is what we called it, my old school or um, or you want to come up, you know, or you, you don't, you know, you don't want to rock the boat for your tenure track. So, you know, you just, you just kind of go along with it. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's so many things that you want to vent about or talk about, um, but it's just not being taken seriously or, yeah, you don't, you don't want to sacrifice or sabotage the position you're in. Mm -hmm. Or seem as that angry black woman or be the difficult colleague, you know, mm -hmm. which we're often called if we yeah. get frustrated and, and yeah. we're not, we're not helpful enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one thing I would say to in like any educator or curator or conservator that might be watching is that we think of history as being something in the past, but we're actually making history right now. And you want to make sure you're, that you're on the right side of history. I think about it all the time because I study the dress up and study people. And every time I go to a museum collection, I'm like, do you have any pieces 
born by enslaved people or made by enslaved people? And the response is more often than not, no. Like, of course, the dress of enslaved people wasn't preserved in many collections. Um, so I would tell, you know, just to go back to your initial question about like museum collections, um, you know, you have the power to shape history. Like, are you are you going to get another Valentino gown or are you going to get a Black Lives Matter t-shirt? Are you going to get like the pussy hat or even something like, you know, Crocs? Like, that's important. People wear Crocs and Uggs. They might not be, they might not be fashionable, but it's how people actually engage with the fashion system. We're going to move into questions from the audience now. So first up, we have a question from Genevieve, and it's, fashion has a long history of borrowing, aka stealing, the work and culture of non-white communities. How do we work this narrative into our teachings in a productive way? How do we highlight this topic without engaging in cancel culture, which focuses on individual crimes rather than the system that allows them? I mean, it's a tricky conversation. Um, I often like to sort of center that conversation around power um, because, I mean, you know, if two groups of equal power are borrowing from each other, it feels less problematic. But it's if the if the if there's a power equilibrium, like a very wealthy white male hetero person borrowing from a minority, marginalized, poor community then there's something wrong with that. Um, but at the same time, you know, we're constantly borrowing from each other. Like it's just, we're human beings. Like, but you know, it's how to identify when it's problematic and when it's less problematic. Mm -hmm. I agree. I mean, um, in, in thinking about that, we've developed that at Ryerson. Um, there was a cultural appropriation assignment that the students would do where they would set out to a department store or a retail environment and see um, an example of cultural appropriation, um, which can be tricky because the students then at like the first year level or second year level need to understand if they're really seeing cultural appropriation at play and in what way. Um, but in whatever way that educators have tried to kind of create assignments around borrowing or cultural appropriation, um, it is key. I mean, it, it's tricky, as Jonathan was saying, um, I, I still grapple with this topic because, I mean, cross-pollination and appropriation and adoption and inspiration um, has gone on for centuries, upon centuries, and um, it is a cornerstone of fashion history and art history. Um, so it gets really difficult to tease out um, who owns what culture, what style, or, you know, um, can really kind of trademark something. Um, it, it's very difficult to do. So, um, it, and, you know, also when we're talking about fashion history, fashion design, very passionate fashion designers and some of our most legendary fashion designers really pride themselves on being referential, um, no, showing off their, their knowledge of art history or literature or fashion history, um, their, um, their predecessors through their collections. And so they take it very seriously and get very sensitive about it because they feel like they put a great deal of thought into somewhere where they have traveled or something that they had just immersed themselves in and then materialized it into this collection. Um, but uh, as Jonathan was saying, when it comes to um, the retail aspect and when we're producing these things and trying to profit from them, if you are a luxury brand and um, it's supposed to be homage or you know part of the recipe of the, your creative genius, your designer, um, but you're making money off of a community that has been historically disenfranchised or oppressed, there, you're probably going to get some call outs. You know, there's going to be questions. And so then it becomes something where, you know, like in the industry, we're kind of grappling with these best practices of, okay, should you, you know, really give a full acknowledgement in the show notes during the runway show or, you know, and then the editorials when you're doing something, like let everyone know exactly what you were referencing. And then also, should you go an extra step forward, uh, further and um, do some profit sharing here? Like, you know, we worked with this community and they're profiting with us or, you know, so the acknowledgement plus, um, 
you know, the sharing of profit um, as an example. Uh, so it, I think the fashion industry is trying to adjust or adapt to all of this. And um, since cultural appropriation has been such a buzzy word for the last 10 years, um, and so it, it's complicated. And um, I honestly believe like cultural appropriation uh, and inspiration really needs to be kind of worked out through discussion and fully understanding the context before we jump down someone's throat and call them, you know, stealing something. Um, because we still also, in fashion schools, um, there's still design professors who urge their students and encourage them to go out and find another culture that, you know, is not their own and get inspired by it and build a mood board or a collection or something around it. So you also have students who are very confused because they feel like that's what makes fashion so vibrant is this sort of cultural exchange or this is, you know, this exchange of ideas and um, designs. So, so where do we go from here? And so I think it's very carefully is how we do that um, with context and understanding um, power dynamics, you know, starting there with students, understanding privilege. Um, so, so yeah, it, it, it's a little messy <laughs> with everything that I'm kind of dumping out here, but um, that's precisely what we're kind of dealing with now in the 21st century when it comes to inspiration and exchange. We have another question from Kat, and it's, do you have a favorite light bulb moment where what you were teaching really hit home for you for your students? Was there a particular subject, text, or resource centered in that moment? And what steps do you think could help make that text or resource more generally ex accessible? I think for me, um, what's often a light bulb moment for my students or just people in general um, is um, part of my research is on the company Brooks Brothers and its connection to slavery. And if I just start off by saying like, oh, my research is on the dress of enslaved people, how they express their political ideas and far from our freedom through dress, they're like, oh, that's that's really specific. That's really niche. But when I sort of mention Brooks Brothers, they're like, oh, I've heard of that. My grandfather was Brooks Brothers. So it's like, I have a connection to this. It's not just some like topic that's really special or niche or particular, like I'm implicated in this as well. I, I think, and this isn't really related to a certain reading, but it's also just kind of a moment to, I think one of my other frustrating moments is, um, you know, I think a light bulb moment is when I walk through the door, you know, on the first day of school, you know, back in the days when we were meeting, you know, physically, but, you know, and the, almost eight years, seven and a half years I've been teaching, you know, it becomes a light bulb moment or a wow, you know, when I come in to teach fashion theory or fashion history and I'm black, you know, and it's like, how is she going to do this? You know? And so again, it's kind of like everything that I've had to learn to teach these things, um, things that maybe not even relatable for me. Um, that's a big moment for students because for, numerous students, including my black students in the last seven and a half years, they'll tell me, you are the first black professor I've ever had, you know, and for some white students, they loved it, you know, and I would talk to them about my master's thesis research, which actually had nothing to do with race. It was about the dress practices of divorced women, like how people get over breakups through dress and cosmetic practices, and, and my fascination with how we put ourselves together to get through things. And, you know, that was a bunch of light bulb moments for students. And, um, you know, those were my best years. Teaching in New York, I look back fondly because it was just these really great intimate discussions with students where their light bulb moment was, I didn't know that I could think about fashion in this way. Um, and, and some of the most profound conversations were also just not even talking about race. It was just the students getting to know me and me getting to know them and me just kind of providing a very different experience for them. Something, you know, from the hometowns that they had come from, not seeing anyone who looked like me and then having this rich dialogue or conversation about why we wear what we wear. So 
I, I guess in a more like in a larger sense, that was sort of the light bulb moments for me. Um, just kind of getting to know each other, just expanding our own environments. I would say uh, one of the classes that was the most enjoyable was a um, seminar class where we reconstructed some garments that were worn by uh, Mary Seacole, who was, um, she was Scottish and Jamaican. And so for having students to read the text, do a narrative analysis, and then actually reproduce um, her garments. And then we even made body forms that um, were a representative of her from what we could find um, from um, photographs. We didn't really use the drawings, of course, but the photographs of her. Um, that was exciting um, to have. And you know, I was the professor for the class and the only person of color in the class. And so um, it was nice to see students engage um, in that topic and learn more about her. We have a question from Harold, and he says he's trying to find a doctoral fashion slash costume history program that focuses on narratives in the Afro diaspora. What was yours or you guys' academic journey of trying to figure out which program was right for you? Well, I can speak um, more briefly um, about the MA experience. I mean, nearly 10 years ago, it was just finding, I, I had a background in cultural anthropology and art history. And so I was looking for a program that integrated fashion um, with anthropology and sociology and art history. And it, um, the Parsons Fashion Studies program nailed it. Um, but it, we were sort of guinea pigs in the beginning, you know, I was in the second cohort. Um, my good friends were all in the first cohort. I mean, so they were really just kind of dipping their toe into it, not knowing a whole lot what to expect, but we all came into it with our own ideas of what we wanted to make of it. Um, which I guess kind of speaks to my whole response to that is that um, it was the program that was just the perfect fit for me and it allowed just enough room or freedom for me to explore things in the way that I wanted to. I knew exactly what I wanted to write for my thesis, even when I got into the program. So, um, and what I wanted to do when I got out of the program, I knew precisely, you know, what kind of career I wanted to build for myself after that. Um, and it was gonna be unconventional, I knew for sure. And I loved that I was going to a school that kind of embraced the unconventional uh, or the untraditional non-traditional. So, um, so really kind of the spirit or attitude of the institution is what I was after. Um, I like spaces with lots of freedom so I can do what I want because I've got my own ideas. Um, I didn't want anything too rigid or, you know, really kind of trying to keep me in lockstep um, with tradition or the ways that we should talk about things or study things and, and who's, what the canon is and things like that. Um, so it, so I think it really comes down to kind of um, uh, your spiritual alignment with your institution um, in some ways. That's one answer I have. I mean, I don't think that fully embodies um, what the answer could be with uh, my partners here in this conversation. Um, but that, for me, it's about that spiritual alignment and seeing what fits for you and um, what you can do with the ideas that you're already coming into it with. I think it's great that the person who posed the question knows exactly what they want to do because when I entered grad school, I just knew that I wanted to read good books, have some interesting conversations, travel. <laughs> and it was in the process of being in grad school that I really like solidified as a fashion scholar, but I entered grad school thinking that I would be a scholar of slavery. And I am. But I, I didn't have a fashion lens. It was in the process of doing the PhD that I realized, like, I, I want to unite my interest in fashion with my interest in slavery. Um, so, I mean, I would tell the student to think about grad school as an apprenticeship. 
like think about who you want to work with. Are there any scholars whose work that you want to align yourself with and then choose a program based on that? And I will say I um, didn't have it together like my um, colleagues on the panel. I did not know what my topic would be. I, I'm trained as a, a designer and I did not uh, think that I was going to do a work that um, for my dissertation topic that dealt with a historical topic and um, and with the social social psychology of that, I just I did not know. It took a while for me to to figure that out in a lot of conversations. Uh, I would say definitely start to understand the culture of the program and the work that the individuals are doing there, uh, because you're you're going to spend a lot of time with the faculty, your major professor. Uh, to me, that's a partnership that should. Be lifetime, you know, if you have the right partnership there, um, and really just you know, go with your gut of how you feel, and if you can work with that those individuals. No one at my institution was working in African American female slave appearance. No one was. Uh, I ended up my major professor was a textile scientist, but she was an excellent researcher. She supported me um, in my topic. And um, and that was the most important thing. I never got, I mean, actually they encouraged me to even um, pursue the topic. And I was like, I, I, I don't know if that's what I want to pursue. And so I was completely supported and still am um, by uh, my uh, former professors in, in what I do. And I know that they have my back, they're my mentors. There are people I can call on. Um, email, text, uh, Zoom lips to this day over almost 25 years later. So really finding people that you know are going to support you through one, that degree, but then also later on um, in your career too. So when I was applying for the department chair position, I had all of them on speed dial because I had questions to ask like, what am I doing? What should I be asking? What should I be doing? So, um, you know, it really um, meeting individuals if you can. I know face to face is hard, but uh, going with that gut feeling, like you know, you know that they're going to be there with you and forming that relationship. So taking the time to do the research, um, talk to other graduate students in the program too, to see what support that they are getting. Um, I think is very important too as you're looking for a program. For our final question, um, this one's from Ariel, and it's, have you ever experienced a student or colleague unknowingly make a racially insensitive comment? How did you respond to the student or colleague if you did to make it a teaching moment as opposed to a shaming moment? I don't, I, I think, um, I don't think I have, luckily or amazingly. Um, it, well, it, it's always kind of resolved itself. Um, the, in my fashion and race class uh, in New York, there was maybe one or two instances, um, I, I'd even actually say one, um, where a student just kind of um, might make a statement about what they don't fully understand or know, but then the other students kind of jumped in and then just sort of resolved it by creating a, a, a whole um, conversation or discussion around it. Um, so, uh, well, I guess one that uh, everyone should know is the student was just kind of making a comment that slavery still exists, and she had said that really kind of the enslavement that we see going on in different countries right now is the same thing as enslavement as we know it in mainly in the eight, late 18th or early 19th century with black people. And so one of my students who was Afro Latinx was very upset saying those two forms of slavery, like this contemporary slavery you're talking about and that kind of slavery are not the same thing. And the other student said, well, how is it not? You know, it's still slavery. We should be upset about it and fight for it. 
so it ended up being this whole kind of issue and um uh, the student was, one of the students was really upset and one student cried, you know, because she just was trying to talk, uh, talk about slavery as she knew it, but she wasn't, she didn't identify as black. And so, I mean, but it wasn't really, I, I don't know if I really call that racially insensitive or a slur or anything like that. Um, but it was just something that we all got to have a discussion about for sure. Um, so, so yeah, um, but I, I've been very thankful that at least thus far, um, the classroom has been just a wonderful, like a dream in terms of the diversity and representation in that room, um, where it's had just such an even balance of all these different kind of lived experiences, nationalities and ethnicities, all there to listen and learn um, from each other. So and it's just incredibly respectful and everyone just is there to give each other space. Um, and really kind of draw something out of it and build something. I've, I've had a number of like negative experiences. Um, I can remember like once um, I was a TA for a class on indigenous North America and I had a Trump supporting student. And I guess my response to the, the question would be that you always have to come from a place of empathy and understanding because when I was 17, 18, 19, 20, I'm sure I said some crazy things. Like people pulled me aside and be like, listen, you, you, you can't say that, or there's a better way to say that, or you need to like be checked sometimes. So, I mean, when I have those experiences, instead of sort of like jumping down someone's throat, I do try to make it a teachable moment and pull them aside and be like, listen, you know, there's a better way to articulate yourself or there's a better way to, to sort of express yourself or you could have said that differently. Um, so that would be my response. And I would really say it, it have to, you have to consider the context. I mean, there's some situations that you have to um, call the person out right then and there you know, and do it in a respectful way. Um, other situations, you may pull, pull them aside. Um, you know, as an administrator, uh, you know, I, I see a lot of um, different things that happen. And, you know, sometimes it's, you know, sitting down with uh, a person multiple times and having conversations um, and documenting what's happening. And then if you have to work with, um, in your human resource department too, to uh, help make changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it, just to piggyback off of that response, I think it all comes down to conversations. Like you have to talk, talk it out. And, you know, I've had a number of situations and I sat down with the person and we had a conversation. I was like, oh, okay, I disagree with you, but I see where you're coming from now. Um, so I would just echo what you said about conversations. Well, I'd like to thank all of the panelists for their time tonight and these valuable insights that will help both students and colleagues navigate fashion. And I'd like to pass it back to Dr. Sklar. Great. Well, once again, we'd like to thank today's speakers for their time and efforts. And we also like to thank all of you that attended. Um, and we'd like to take a moment and thank the organizers who collaborated on this, including our moderator, Indira Washington, an undergraduate student here at UGA, UGA PhD, Samira Covington, Costume Society of America board member, Graham Wartsberger, who runs all of our CSA visual content, CSA VP external, Adam McFarlane, and CSA office, Kate Ahn, and of course, Krista Miller-Zone, who's the executive director of CSA. The panel was recorded, and it will be on YouTube very soon, we'll let you know. Please follow Costume Society of America on Facebook and Instagram. And if you're able, consider making a donation to Costume Society of America to help us support mo more programming of this nature. We will be having more conversations on dress and we look forward to having you there. Thank you.